This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. In an ideal world, we'd all save conscientiously for our old age as soon as we get our first job, invest initially in high return assets, and as we get older, decrease the risk, and finally on retirement, buy an annuity for the lowest fees that we can find. Reality is a long way from that. A few people do save in this way. Some people just cross their fingers and hope the state's going to pay up for their golden old age, and most fall somewhere in between, not really understanding the system, getting impatient with their savings, and just hoping it's going to turn out all right in the end. Professor Olivia Mitchell from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania is here at the Australian School of Business to give a seminar on how financial literacy and impatience shape retirement wealth and investment patterns. So, Olivia, to start with, can I ask, what do you mean by being impatient? Well, impatient in the context of retirement saving means that people don't focus on tomorrow. They're overly interested in gratifying their needs and desires today. And even though they know they should save for tomorrow, they don't. And so that's the problem with impatience. So do we need to separate financial literacy away from being impatient, or is there a connection between the two? Well, both financial literacy and impatience have implications for retirement saving. Uh, we've shown in a number of other studies that people who are financially literate tend to not understand the value of compounding, they don't understand the impact of inflation, and they don't really think about the future very effectively. So therefore, they don't save. The issue with impatience is that people might well know what they should be doing, but they fail to execute. And so we really do identify two different factors in successful retirement saving. And when you're looking at this uh, to write the paper, how did you test it? Well, what we did was we, first of all, queried a nationally representative sample of people, this happened to be in Chile, about their financial literacy. And so we learned a great deal of things uh, there. But in addition, what we did was design a short experiment. We asked you to fill out a three-page shopping questionnaire. If you did it now, you would get a gift card worth about $5, and you could take it to the grocery store. If you said to me, no, I don't want to do it now, I want to do it later, we would actually give you more money, $10 on the gift card, but only after you sent it in, in a postpaid self-addressed envelope. So the notion was that if you delayed gratification, you get twice as much money as if you insisted on getting the gift card now. And what we are interested in seeing is who insisted on it now, who is willing to defer for a very high rate of return, and what that implied about their behaviors. Uh, and could you initially tell, as soon as you were talking to people, that there were certain stereotypes of people who would go for instant gratification, or the more literate people would want a better rate of return? Unfortunately, people don't seem to wear uh, an impatient scale on their chest, uh, which would make it easier for us to figure out who needs help. But what we did find was that about half of the sample, even though they knew they could make double the money by waiting, said, no, I want the gift card now. Maybe they knew they were busy, they had other things on their mind, maybe they needed the money now. So all those factors would contribute to rationally deciding to take the gift card now. The other half of the sample said, no, no, I understand that I want more later. The interesting thing was only about two-thirds of those who deferred actually sent back in the gift card. The other portion, who said they were going to be rational and defer gratification, never got around to it. And it's that intermediate group, the people who were not effective in executing their best laid plans, those are the ones we found most interesting. Yeah, that, that's really fascinating because it's obviously people who know what they should be doing but just don't seem to be bothered. Well, I think that speaks to the, uh, the reality that many of us have 
best laid plans, but it takes a fair amount of initiative to get over inertia to actually implement those plans. And the other thing that we found is that the people who were inefficacious defers, people who were defers but then couldn't carry through, those people also had a number of other characteristics. For example, among the women, they were less likely to get annual checkups and uh, mammograms and things of this sort. They were less likely to get exercise, to invest in their health for the future. So there were a number of characteristics that suggested that people who are impatient don't invest across a number of dimensions, which could be very important. Yeah, and equally, I understand you were testing financial literacy, how well people could work out interest rates and things like that. What did you discover? Well, the strategy around financial literacy is to examine whether illiteracy makes people make bad decisions. And in the case of Chile, they actually have a pension system, which is quite similar to the Australian. It's a superannuation scheme. They have to contribute 10% of their pay into their annual accounts. But they're also allowed to top it up, if they wish, with voluntary savings. And they have some choice over the investments. Now, the interesting thing is that in Chile, there are five different investment managers, licensed managers, and they charge different fees because the fees are regulated. So the question was, were people able to understand the fee structure and select the account, the fund manager, best for them? In order to see whether financial literacy affected this choice, what we did was present them with information in two ways. First of all, we said to them, imagine here are the five choices, and the fees are expressed in terms of the commissions per year that you will not invest, that you won't save as a function of the charges associated with each manager. The alternative was to say, here's how much money you will have above the the, the least cost one or below the least cost one. And what we found is that presenting these fees and charges in terms of the impact on the ultimate retirement account was much more effective. People really saw the gains and they selected the least cost fund manager. In other research, we've tried to show that when you show people the, the dollar or the peso gains, they're much more sensitive than when you show them just the percentage fees. So how you frame the investment decision is very, very critical to retirement accumulation. Well, of course, this debate is uh, raging in Australia at the moment in terms of fees for superannuation mm -hmm. and just how you frame that question. Does it just come down to simplicity of you need a bottom line of saying you'll save this much or do you need a little bit more information for those people who are literate and can then try and work it out themselves? Well, what we found is the people who are most susceptible to different ways of framing the fees and commissions are the least financially literate. Whereas people who are quite well versed in financial matters are less sensitive to whether it's presented this way or that. And indeed, most of us are very concerned at getting people in the bottom half of the wage distribution to save more. So I think that's where it really pays to offer alternative ways to interpret the impact of saving for retirement and the fees thereof. Uh, and earlier you were saying that you did notice some differences between genders in terms of people who are impatient. Did you notice any other differences either in age or in gender? Uh, well, we had expected that younger people would perhaps be more versed in financial literacy. And there is some evidence that, at least in Chile, when they reformed the school system, the next generation has been doing better than the prior generation. But typically we find across the board, and this is in a number of studies around the world, that women tend to be less financially literate than men. So on the one hand, they're less versed in things like compound interest and inflation and so forth. On the other hand, they know they don't know. Whereas men uh, who don't know are very confident that they know the truth. So there's a very interesting difference by sex in the way that people perceive what they know and how confident they are about it. And of course, that, that then provokes a question of how do you solve that of those people who assume that they know everything, but actually they know nothing at all? 
Well, uh, it's always difficult to expose people to their own ignorance. What I would say is that uh, there are a number of simple questions that we've devised that will help explore how much people know about risk diversification, how much people know about compound interests and so on. And based on those questions, then one can target specific groups that are most in need of financial literacy. But finally then, it's quite clear that there does seem to be a very direct connection between how financially literate people are and how much wealth they're going to have when they come to retire. It's absolutely true that financial literacy is critical for planning for retirement and then planning in turn leads to more successful retirement accumulation. In the US, we've seen several states mandate financial literacy training in high school for students. And what we can show is that in those states, the young people that grew up and were exposed to this training do better saving for retirement planning and end up with more wealth than the kids who didn't. So you have to start young. Don't give up on the middle-aged or the old, but definitely invest in financial literacy. And that financial literacy can be at a fairly basic level. It, it only takes a few hours to educate people. It can. I think that it's always the case that the financial marketplace will think of more complex products, more elegant mortgages with more bells and whistles. So simple financial literacy certainly won't make you an investment banker. But on the other hand, for most of the decisions that consumers make, auto loans, credit card loans, mortgages and so forth, a little bit of knowledge can go a long way. Olivia Mitchell, thank you very much. Thank you. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.